Hey everyone, my name is Maria Hinojosa. It's good to be here with you today. Um, how many of you, having just watched that, um, are pretty shocked by the numbers and the data? If, you, if you're shocked by that and just kind of surprised, can you applaud? <laughs> so how many of you were aware of those numbers and statistics? Okay, so, so equal, equal measure. Um, then you know the name of this panel is Immigrants in Terror. Um, and it is a particular moment in our American history where we are sitting on this panel today with an amazing group of people. And yet today, right now, there are people just like you and me who are literally living in terror in our country, right now. In Long Island, there are people who are afraid to come out of their homes. Why? Because of the immigrant raids that have intensified and were announced during Christmas time. Um, so we have to understand that there is a particular kind of terror that we are all living with, and it's not far away. It's literally we can touch it. In fact, right here in, on this campus, there are young people who, are family, who have family members or friends who are living in that terror. So, while people talk about mass incarceration, the whole conversation about immigrant detention and what we call at Latino USA and Futuro Media Group, the ICE industrial complex. Um, it's not something that we see, it's not something that we know, that we touch, and yet for people right now, it is very real and it's happening under our watch. The three people I'm joined with on stage, honestly, I'm, I'm so honored to be with them. Um, first, uh, Adama Ba, who was detained by authorities, by immigration authorities, per presumed um, terrorist activity, which was unfounded. Later it was found out that it was entirely unfounded. And she was 16 years old. She was a high school kid when they came to get her. Thank you, Adama, for being here. Khalil Cumberbatch um, was held for six months in an immigrant detention center um, before he received a pardon from Governor Am Andrew Cuomo. Um, <clears throat> he's now um, an activist for social justice, and actually Adama is a mom of two cute little girl and a boy, so she's busy. Um, and also joining me is uh, Laili, who is the head of the Tahir Center, um, which is, it's Laili uh, Miller Muro, who is uh, the founder and executive director of the Tahiri Justice Center, um, and she's been working with immigrants, um, women and children fleeing violence in their homelands. So let's start, um, let's start with you, Adaba. Just paint a picture. You're 16 years old. You're a sophomore, junior in high school? Yes, junior. Here in, in New York City? New York City. Okay. And what happens? Uh, well, I should start by saying that I came to this country at the age of two years old. I came with my mother. And, and you were born where? I was, we're originally from Guinea Conakry, which is in West Africa. And uh, I lived a, a normal life. And until the age of 16 years old, um, officers came and raided my home, FBI, um, ICE, which is also known as immigration. Um, what time did they come? They came early in the morning, about 6 a.m. Were you kind of... I was still in bed. I was still sleeping. Um, so we, they came in the bedroom and frightened all of us and woke us up and told us all to go to the living room. We all did they identify themselves? Uh, I'm not to me, no. But my mother said they did identify. I'm only 16. Even if you did identify yourself, I wouldn't know who you are. Okay. Um, so we went into the living room, and we're watching them just rumbling around in a house looking for something. And I'm unsure what they're looking for. And they're yelling at my mom in the bedroom. People are yelling. And I don't know what's going on. I'm just scared, nervous. First reaction, I start asking my sibling in my language, what's going on? What are they doing? And they're like responding and the officer tells us, shut up, or you only speak English. But, but they never, you don't remember, your mom told you that they had a warrant, that they said, this, this is, is who we are, this is what we're doing here, this is what we're looking for, and we have a legal right to be in your home? Was they that ever presented They have never to presented to me, no. Um, as for my mother, I do not know what was presented to her, but that was never presented to me. Long and short, you end up spending six weeks in a detention center. Um, as they came to the house, they detained myself and my father, um, and they took us to the detention center. I spent six and a half weeks, 
and my father was ultimately deported. And you haven't seen him since? Uh, he actually just came back in 2011. So he's back and he was back able after, to return? After, yes, he's able to return. That's kind of amazing. Yes. <laughs> um, that's amazing. But that's a separate part of this story. Um, just so we understand, you were in detention for six weeks, and then after that, not how many days, not how many months, how many years did you have an ankle shackle on your ankle? I had to wear the ankle bracelet for three years. Um, as I said, I did not know I was here illegally until I was 16 in handcuffs. Uh, and they were threatening to deport me and deported me to Guinea, a country that I've never been to, a country that I don't know. I do know the language and I do know the culture, but again, I don't know the laws of that land. I'm American, so. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that decision, especially since um, in Adaba's case, everything was unfounded, but the decision to why put on an ankle shackle for three years. Um, and if there's a profit motive there. But Khalil, let's talk a little bit about your case. Um, you were in the country with a green card. Um, you committed a crime yes. at some point when you were younger, mm -hmm. like a lot of young kids, right? Um, you served your time, yep. so you completed your sentence. And you were living your life, right? Um, and then what happens? How long after you had actually finished your, crime, your sentence, how long after did something change for you? So it was about four years after my release from prison. I had successfully completed parole and completed an undergraduate degree and was one week away from completing a graduate degree when similar, uh, a very similar story, uh, we got a, my wife and I uh, got a knock on our door around seven o'clock in the morning. And you know we had also have two young children. So seven o'clock in the morning, there's a lot of hustle and bustle in the house and we were getting ourselves ready for our day and getting, our, uh, getting ready to get our daughters up out of their uh, uh, slumber. And we get a knock on the door and we look outside and my wife says that it's, that it's the police. And they had jackets that identified themselves as police. Um, and as for someone, see, it's, it's very different for someone who has criminal justice involvement because although I had successfully completed parole, you always know that they have the ability to do this, that you're never really out of the criminal justice system. And although, you've, although I had successfully completed parole and I had all of these things accomplished, I knew for a fact that they could just come to my home and ask me a question. And therefore, when police were at, or what they identified to be police were at the door, it wasn't really a surprise. My wife and I opened up the door, and it was in our living room that they told me and my wife the real reason that they were there, who, were, who they were really there for, so, on behalf of, and what their purpose was. <clears throat> so when you opened the door, they never said, uh, Mr. Cumberbatch, we are from Immigration Customs Enforcement, never and we are looking for you. As a matter of fact, they, they had never identified themselves as Immigration Customs Enforcement officers until after they had told me the reason they were there, that they actually said that we were here to apprehend you. Oh, and by the way, we're here on behalf of Immigration Customs Enforcement, an entity of Department of Homeland Security. Okay. So why were they detaining you? you what, what does one case have to do with another? You had actually served your time. Why now were immigration agents coming to look for you? So I guess the short answer is that it's double jeopardy. I think that the more complicated answer is that my criminal conviction put me in the same category in terms of immigration policy as someone who uh, is known to, uh, um, to be a threat to national security or someone who has known to commit some terrorist act. The fact that I had a robbery in the first degree um, put me in this gr group of cate this category called aggravated felonies, which I should note that, uh, that, all, that crimes within that category do not have to be aggravated and they do not have to be felonies, but mines happen to fall in that. And because I had fell into that category, it put me at the top of the list in terms of who they were targeting to detain and deport. So, so even though the Obama administration has stressed that they are only going after hardened criminals, <laughs> in fact, even though you had served your time, you were on the list. Yeah, so the, the, just the, the, the mere fact that I had had a felony conviction, despite everything that I had accomplished po after that felony conviction, during my incarceration and post-incarceration, um, which I should note that it was the same items that, uh, that the government actually ended up acknowledging and ended up using as the reason to release me, uh, it were the same things that they refused to take into consideration in the beginning of my pr uh, immigration proceedings. Okay, and we're gonna come back and talk about what it was like to be in a detention center versus being in a prison, a bureau of prison. There is, as we saw, 
in the video, um, it's a very different reality. There is an entirely separate legal system that is the immigration legal system that um, is handled entirely differently than the criminal justice system. So these basic things, and I, I'm saying that over and over again, because these are basic things that we believe in criminal justice and due process in our country, kind of basic. People are identifying themselves and they're telling you why they're there. So Laylee, just give us a couple of, of like top of the line responses to the legal rights that actually, not just them, or myself as somebody who was also not born in this country, but actually what everybody else who may think, well, it's immigrants, maybe that's not me. Actually, what does this have to do with them in terms of violations of due process, basic civil rights, those kinds of basic ideas of rights? Well, I mean, I think we grow up, if, you know, if we go to school in the United States, we have a fiction that there's a, a Bill of Rights and that the Bill of Rights applies to people who live in the United States. Um, but that's a fiction because, in fact, the entire Bill of Rights does not apply equally to everyone in the United States. Um, there's a hierarchy of rights and who gets them. And if you are a lawful permanent resident entitled to be here, as both of you were, there is a lesser degree of due process rights that you're entitled to. But God forbid you are a refugee, you're undocumented, and you're fleeing for your life from Central America, for example, and you cross the Texan border, you're placed in incarceration. There are 100,000 children who have fled the border um, over our border over the last two years, fleeing violence. They are refugees under US and international law. They're entitled to be here. Mm -hmm. And we incarcerate them in jail conditions with no access to legal representation. What are, what are the first things that the children tell you when they get into custody? Um, into immigrant detention centers on the U.S.-Mexico border. What, do you know what the word is that they use for the place where they are put, where they are held? Hileras, they're ice boxes. Yelera. The Yelera, which means refrigerator or ice box. This is what the children know is the place where they're put when they first are come into contact with immigration But um, actually, officials. it's not the children. It's Border Patrol themselves. Border Patrol calls it that. Mm -hmm. So when they're saying to you, we're bringing you into detention, it is a phrase they have coined. Wow. It is a, a reality they have designed, and they threaten people with these ice boxes. They then put them into them. Their lips turn blue. They become chapped. Their fingers turn blue. They take out their outer, outer garments. They're given no sanitary napkins, no personal items. 20 women and children are placed in one place for days at a time. The lights are kept on. They don't know whether it's night or day. There's one toilet in the corner that's public to everybody and four sanitary napkins that are given for 20 women at one time. People are stained in blood. People are stained in urine. And they're given sandwiches two times a day that they have to grab in order to get. And one thermos that's placed there with water that smells like bleach and burns their throats. And this is happening today. This is happening every day to thousands and thousands of people. And there's a billion dollar private industry that's benefiting from this. The GeoCorp and the Corrections Corporation of America, which are incarceration companies, are making millions of dollars over these detention facilities at our southern border, which are housing children. And by the way, a long time ago, we figured out children shouldn't be in jail. Young kids don't deserve to be in jail. It's not good for their mind. It's not good for their bodies. They become sick. A, ch a woman, for example, who might be a convicted felon is not allowed to raise her child in jail. But starting for the first time in the United States in July of 2014, the Obama administration began jailing children and their mothers coming across the border. And last August, a federal judge said that is illegal and you're not allowed to do it and ordered them to stop and they still haven't. Khalil, what's going on for you right now as you're hearing this, the kind of the litany of, of the, the, the violations? Yeah, I have to watch my language, what's really going on in my mind. Um, I was in that icebox. I mean, I was not in the facility that, you, that you're talking about. I was held in a uh, correctional facility, which, is a, which was a Hudson County uh, correctional facility in, Hudson, in Kearney, New Jersey. And when you first come in, that's exactly where they put you. They put you in these housing units uh, that they call the icebox. 
Uh, they keep the temperature low on purpose. Uh, the, the air conditioner is running constantly, regardless of the time of year. And for those who know, even with central air, uh, maybe some of the students here know it, any building that's central air, it's, all, it's always either or, right? It's all the, either re really, really warm or really, really cold. And when you're exposed to that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, for what could be potentially months or years, um, it has a physical effect on you. So I remember actually sitting in that ice box and covering myself with two blankets, and the officer asking me very sarcastically why I had on two blankets, knowing very well that her herself was wearing two jackets. But it was really just a way to, ex to, imp to, to, to show you from the very beginning of your process in immigration detention that you are less than a human being and that you're not deserving uh, to even have the, any comfort such as body warmth. Why did they say you were, why did you believe that they treated you as, or thought of you as less than a human being? Was there a term that they used, or what would they say that? Yeah, I think any term that's used that, that takes away a person's humanity, felon, inmate, detainee, uh, um, immigrant, anything that refuses to acknowledge a person's human, uh, humanity is something that is degrading. And from the time that you come into immigration attention, they make it known uh, that, you are de that, you are an that you are a detainee. And there's a whole bunch of connotations that come with that, but one of them that are made very clear is that you do not have control over yourself, and therefore you do not have control over the environment. Did they call you, they, did they say that you were an illegal? Um, I can't remember anyone saying that I was here illegally. No, 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 uh, that they I mean, actually, that, because that's something that we've heard in our reporting in the detention centers in Arizona and in Texas, that you know, you're illegal and therefore you don't have any rights. But let me ask you, Adaba, um, what was your understanding of, of why, did, did, I mean, you are, this happened 10 years ago. You're so beautiful, you have an amazing, beautiful face and smile. How have you come to terms with the fact that, that what happened to you was actually propagated by the American government um, on a 16-year-old girl with little proof after everybody has watched um, Making of a Murder on Netflix, um, you know, and everybody's thinking about where these accusations come from. How have you processed this? Um, as a 16-year-old, it's impossible to process it. Um, I knew once I came out, I had to live re reality that my father's not here and I have sib siblings dependent on me. So I had to get up and I had to move on. Um, I've never really gotten a chance to relax and say, okay, to start the healing process, okay? Because I have never received an answer as to why I was detained mm -hmm. or why this happened to me, especially as a 16-year-old. So um, I, I'm still processing it. And has anyone, so there's never been a, a recognition, any kind of follow through with you? And no apology, no follow up, no, oh, the reason why we detained you is so, in, no, nothing. And, and what's it like for you to, be here on this stage speaking about this? Well, this is important for me because mm -hmm. there are 16-year-olds out there. Maybe your children are out there and they're waiting to pick them up one day. You don't know who's next. And unfortunately, I lived in a fairy tale thinking that no one would ever arrest me. No one can imagine something like that. So as a mother now, I have to think about my children. Are, they're American citizens, but will they ever come for them? Will they ever say, oh, because they're Muslims, oh, because they're blacks, or because of this? What is the next excuse? So there are all kinds of humanitarian due process issues that we've talked about, which we are, are very impactful, right? When you realize that right now, in this very day, there are people who are being held without understanding why, which to me is kind of a violation of, um, what is it, the Fourth Amendment? Um, but you know, not understanding why you're being held due process violations, human rights, but let's just talk for a moment about the money. So we know now that the entire budget of immigration detention enforcement now is actually a budget that is larger than all other federal law enforcement agencies combined. So let's just sit with that for a moment. More money is spent today, more of your tax dollars is spent today um, in federal immigration detention and enforcement than all federal law enforcement combined. 
FBI, DEA. Is that possible, Laylee? Because I think it's a lot of people... It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous yeah. because, I mean, you know, people might say, well, um, their flight risks, terrorist risks, you know, whatever the rationale may be given for detention is completely false. When you look at the people in detention, and I want to call out a racial issue too. I mean, we don't detain illegal Canadians. We don't detain people who overstay their visas <laughs> from other countries. There are many, many others. And it, it's the people who are detained who have brown brown, black skin, darker skin, who have less money, who are less able to access attorneys. But in terms of what's effective, there is a 98% compliance rate with immigration court appearances and everything that they're supposed to do to be compliant with immigration status when they have legal advocates and legal representation. And there's no need for an ankle bracelet. It's, it's ineffective and it's expensive. It costs $300 a day to detain an immigrant in detention and there's no need for it. But this industry spent $25 million last year alone lobbying for the system we have now. They benefit from it, and their lobbyists are more well-paid than the nonprofits. They, they have a bigger budget than the nonprofits like us who are advocating on the other side for humanitarian treatment and due process rights. We're, we're wrapping up here, but just briefly from each of you, mm -hmm. why do you think that this issue um, has not connected? Um, we are not, um, this is not front of mind, and oftentimes when I speak to people and interview people, they just say, well, they're here illegally, therefore they, who, who kind of cares? From each of you, why do you think it hasn't pushed through and what do you want to leave the audience with in terms of what their responsibility is and this? And Adaba, let's start with you. Um, I think for someone like myself, I suffered because my parents brought me here, but I suffer for that consequence. And it's not fair uh, for people who don't know their rights. Um, it, it's something that we have to tackle. It's because it never happened to you, you won't understand. Because it didn't happen to your loved one, you won't look into it. So let's avoid other families from being separated and look into immigration reform. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, I think that uh, we, when we talk about immigration detention, we're not talk I think it's important, and I want to leave the audience with this, is that we're not talking about a separate system. We're talking about a system that is heavily intertwined with what we call the criminal justice system. And as a matter of fact, that system feeds another system. Um, so that's a point that I want to leave the audience with. At the organization I work for currently um, as the manager of training and communications, Just Leadership USA, was founded by Glenn Martin, who often says that those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, yet farthest from resources and power. And I think that conversations like this is really important to have the voices of those who are impacted because those are the ones who are going to be at the forefront and need to be at the forefront of any type of reform, uh, particularly when we talk about immigration detention because it is such an insidious system and most people do not, quote unquote, survive it um, to tell their stories that it is, that is something that is um, required for us to kind of share our experiences from the perspective that something needs to be done because this is not an immigrant problem, this is not a Muslim problem, this is not a, a, a Canadian problem, but this is an American problem, right? And we are the ones who are actually funding this system. Thank you. I, I want us to be really careful about how we use the word illegal. You all were, you were legal and you did nothing wrong. The women and children at the border are refugees fleeing extreme violence in Central America. What we are doing to them is tantamount to jailing and punishing someone who's fleeing a burning building because they accidentally jaywalked to get to the other side of the street, even when there was a law on the books that said you're actually allowed to jaywalk if you're fleeing a burning building. That's what our refugees laws are. That's what international national humanitarian law is. They've done nothing wrong, actually. They're coming here seeking protection, and we owe them our compassion and our mercy, but at least we owe them following our own laws, and we're breaking them. Thank you so much to Leili, Khalil, and Adaba, and thank all of you for being here and for having this conversation. Thank you so much.